Okay, everybody, I think we're going to get started. Uh, I'm Pat Jones, the editorial director and publisher of Golf Course Industry Magazine. It's a beautiful day here in Cleveland, Ohio. Sunny skies, uh, fall is in the air, and that's good news for everybody. Uh, I've seen a few uh, few people even starting to blow out their irrigation systems already on, on Twitter earlier today. So it's that happy time of year where we're transitioning out of one season and starting, getting ready to start another one down south. But the one thing we're always interested in is better nutrition and better plants and healthier surfaces for golf to be played on. And that's why we're happy to be uh, hosting a webinar today for the folks from EMP. And I'm going to let them tell you about who they are and what they do. But I, I, the one thing I know is this is an area of, of, of golf agronomics that's developed dramatically in the last 15 years. And, and, and particularly the category of amino acids has changed so much from being, you know, when, when I was a, a younger fella in this business, uh, the word snake oil would get used every time you bring up something like amino acid products. And, and that's really changed. And I think now we understand just how valuable they can be if they're used right and if they're applied the right way and if they're the correct amino acids. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'll introduce our participants here in a minute. But I would like everybody to know that you can ask questions. So if you're among our attendees today and you would like to ask a question, you can simply use your chat button, your question button, and submit a question to me. And I'll pass it along to the, uh, to the presenters and the participants. Uh, so you, that's your chance to interact. Uh, and then at the end of this presentation, uh, we will be recording it. And we will send all of you a copy of the presentation as well as a little bit more information that you can follow up with. So you will be getting that follow up uh, from us here in a few days. So with that, uh, I'm very happy to introduce our, our, our presenters and our host here today. Uh, I'm going to start uh, with uh, George. Uh, George Murray, uh, I want you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do with the ENP. Yeah, great. Thanks, Pat. My name is George Murray, president of the ENP. I also take care of uh, all the formulation work, uh, any technologies we have regarding our fertilizer technologies. Uh, that, uh, that's my duty as well. So I wear a couple different hats there. Um, excited to be here and excited to be presenting uh, about amino acids today. Great. And, and tell us who you've invited because i, I got to tell you, I, I, I know Kurt with your team, but you've got a couple of, you've got a couple of uh, friends of ours to, to participate here today, too. So maybe tell us a little bit about who else is going to be on the webinar today. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Kurt Guerin our director of sales. Uh, he's been with the company for many years now. He's been a part of this innovation and, and development. And Kurt, you know, you're a little closer to that scene. Would you mind introducing our two superintendents we have on board today? Uh, yeah, no problem. Thanks, George, and thanks, Pat, and to Golf Course Industry for uh, hosting this uh, webinar today. <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, I've been with ENP for almost eight years now, working with with our product lines, the ENP Turf line and, and the Foliar Pack line of, of products. And uh, the the two superintendents that we have with us today, one is from uh, from Euclid, Ohio, near near Cleveland, and that's Brent Pallich. He's at uh, Mayfield Sand Ridge Club. So uh, thanks, Brent, for being with us today. I'm glad to be here. And thanks, Brent. And we also have Keith Wood. And Keith Wood is uh, now at Quail Hollow Club down in Charlotte. And um, Keith, uh, uh, want to welcome you today as well. Thanks for having me, Kurt. So, so George, you know, I, I, I want to, to give you the chance to really tell the story about, uh, you know, how superintendents, I think, can do a better job of, of, of leveraging products like these and amino acid-based products in, the, in, their, in their agronomic programs. But, but, you know, just go ahead and get started and tell us, you know, what you hope that people will learn today and, and what they should look forward to and what maybe uh, they can, they can uh, plan on doing with this information when they're when they're all done and they can move forward with their plan for this fall. Absolutely. So, you know, first and foremost, I always like to do an overview of presentations. Um, you know, we're going to start out talking about environmental stressors. And this is not going to take us very long. All we're doing here is we're going to lay a foundation that talks about, hey, very often and, uh, and we have conditions that are less than optimal out there in the golf course. 
and we'll talk about various reasons why, and we'll set the stage for why we need certain tools like amino acids to help our turf go through these conditions. Um, after that, we're going to talk about the amino acid education itself. We'll talk about uh, different ways that uh, these different amino acids are effectuating positive responses in turf and what they're doing. Um, in each one of these different categories we have laid out under amino acid education, Kurt, my co-presenter, along with the superintendents, are going to weigh in and they're going to bring in the, uh, the, the concrete, real-world examples of what happens when we talk about using amino acids. So I'll talk about the abstract, the scientific background, uh, what it's doing from a from an uh, abstract perspective, and then Kurt, the superintendents, will come in from a concrete perspective. And then after that, we'll talk about our view. We'll, we'll go over what we talked about. We'll answer questions. Um, while we're going through this, I do want to I do want to let you guys know that if you have questions, put them in the chat bar. Um, also, feel free to uh, send them out to Twitter. Um, we can answer those live on Twitter. I've got uh, a great team here that's going to be asking me questions while I present. So I'll do my best to kind of juggle duties here presenting and answering questions on Twitter. But uh, either way, just, just send them out. It's great to, uh, to have a dialogue set up. And, and I think that's why we brought on these great superintendents and brought on Kurt today. It's, it's always nice to hear from multiple people during these presentations. So again, any questions, say them loud while we go through. Um, other than that, let's talk about environmental stress. What is stress and how do plants deal with it, right? Stress, the classic definition is a state of strain resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. And I think we can all sit back and we can all say, yes, you know, adverse and demanding. I mean, most of the time we go through our, our growing season opportunities where it's too hot, where it's too cold, where it's too dry. There's always something, right? And so for us, it's, uh, it's how do we deal with this stress and what's causing that stress? There's two types of stress. There's abiotic, which is non-living, and then there's biotic, which is living. And living was something we'll cover down the road. It's not going to be covered today, but typically it's your, your insects and your fungi, bacteria, and such like that. But abiotic stress, and everybody has this, but again, we're just laying a foundation for why we need tools like amino acids in the first place. Uh, water, right? It's too much, it's too little. Um, you know, I think uh, this year uh, in some parts of the country we've had uh, some pretty bad drought conditions and other parts we've had too much. Salt. I think uh, salt levels in the soil, depending on uh, the type of soil that you're in, depending on the drainage, depending on the inputs you're putting in, salt levels are going to be bad. And we're going we're gonna to talk about this as we go through what happens when your salt levels get high. And I don't just mean sodium, I mean soluble salt. What happens when your turf's growing in environments that are, that are salty, right? Temperature, I think we can all get to this. It's too hot or it's too cold. You know, it's, it's seldom just right. And I don't, I don't care where you are in the country, whether you're in the, the southern part or whether you're in the northern part, there always needs to be something about the temperature that we wish we could change. UV radiation, this is uh, something most people don't think about, but the ozone layer is actually thinner today than it was in the 70s. How's that for a statement of the week? Um, so. I feel, my personal opinion is, with the UV radiation that we have, we're causing more stress on turf and plants today than we were 40 years ago. Um, traffic, right? Foot traffic. We've got a variety of uh, things that cause that. You know, we've got people out there on the course. It'd be great if we could grow grass and no one walk on it. That's kind of the principle. So what do we do about that, right? And finally, mowing height. That's another thing, right? It's less than that deal. We had to deal with it. So all these things come into, there's this either acute stress or chronic, meaning long-term, acute being short-term. This is typically the first event in the turf's demise, and we call this spiral of decline. You have an abiotic event that comes in, you stress the turf out, the stress, can, the, the stress causes the turf to, to create these reactive oxygen species, cell death occurs, and then you have these issues come in, uh, the like fungi, like bacteria, like insects, and you have this this, uh, what we call the spiral decline. So ideally, what we're going to do is we're going to, to positively uh, uh, put in these amino acids and, and avoid this, this stress and this spiral decline that we could potentially be going down. So environmental stressors, we know it to be true. Cold temps, hot temps, water, and salt, right? These are these main things that we're talking about. And this blue piece here that's in this cell, this is the vacuum. And we're going to visit this today, and I want you guys to keep this in mind as we're talking. Vacuoles can occupy up to 30% and up to 90% of your cell volume. So when you're talking about turgidity, where you're talking about cells staying alive, it's all about keeping water in that vacuole. Okay? 
And so what happens is we're constantly fighting against outside salt uh, that's, that's causing that water to be pulled out of that vacuole and causing your cells to shrink and die. So a lot of when we talk about stress, it's talking about putting in certain metabolites that are going to keep that water in that vacuole. And at the end of the day, it can be that simple. So what are we going to do about it? Amino acids. Today we're talking about amino acids, and guys, this is not supposed to be you know, a metabolic plant physiology class that would take normally a semester or two in grad school. We're going to be hitting the high notes. We're going to be doing some oversimplification. It is going to get pretty sciencey at times, but again, we're always going to be able to bring it back down and tie it into concrete, real-world examples. Okay. So what do they really do? And I think for me, when I started this journey uh, and came into amino acids, you know, I think there was always a description about amino acids, and it went along the lines of amino acids produce proteins, and they do other great things in the plant, but it was always nebulous. It, it, it was never And for me, you know, when you look at what well, we're seeing better color with amino acids, we're seeing better, you know, insecticide uptake, we're seeing better grow in and better better survival rates when using these amino acids, and why. So we went down this research path and started answering all these questions, you know, there were some facts that came out of the woodwork. And number one is some amino acids are more important than others. You know, when we started years and years and years ago uh, of doing amino acid work, you know, we were using a, a, a package of amino acids that had 18 amino acids, and it was a great story, and, and you know, we all figure in this country more is better, but in this case here, it's not necessarily about the total different number of amino acids, but the total concentration. So applying a specific concentration is important because we're trying to effectuate change, and we're going to cover that in the next slide, but keep that in mind. And finally, amino acids can be used in different ways. Uh, they can be used foliarly. They can be used in the soil. Uh, there's, there's different things that amino acids do, and you can use them as, as physiological tools of sorts. So we, it's important to keep this in mind as we're talking about amino acids today. There are these pools of amino acids, okay? And so they hang out. Amino acids are in the cytoplasm, which is in the general area of your cell. So in the mitochondria, which you know takes care of a different different types of things and energy production for the plant, and they're in a the chloroplast, okay? And what happens is when we put these amino acids in the plant, we want these pools to fill up because when these pools start to fill up of each individual amino acid, the plant goes into this, this, this response that says it wants to metabolize these amino acids. And that's really what we're getting at at the end of the day. The amino acids themselves are great, but we're trying to get to, to their metabolites. We're trying to get the plant to turn them into a downstream product, to send them into the vacuole, to create chlorophyll, to, to, to form an organic form of nitrogen. This is what we're trying to do. And, and so applying a concentration of a single amino acid is, is very important to do that. So, in the old days, when we were going out with 18 different amino acids, and we were applying these 18 different amino acids, but they were all at a low concentration, maybe we were effectuating these changes in the pool to a certain extent, and maybe we weren't. But now we're concentrating on a couple different amino acids, and, this, and today we're going to talk about four different ones, and applying those in higher concentrations. We're seeing these, these, these uh, metabolic uh, changes take place. And that's the exciting part. And, and later in the presentation, we'll talk about some of the research that we've done and how we know we're effectuating these changes. So this is a big shift, guys. This is a big shift for us, and I think uh, this is a big shift potentially for the industry. And uh, so today we're going to be talking about four amino acids. We're going to take uh, the 18, and we're going to boil them down to four. So again, any questions you guys have as we go along, you know, feel free to shout them out. Yeah, guys, just, so, just pass those along via the, uh, the chat function. And uh, if you're like me, you're sitting here uh, trying to process a lot of science at once here. So feel free to jump in with any questions if you want to clarify anything. And, we're, and again, we're just getting started. And these are all going to be repeated here as we go through these five different categories. The first one is going to be increasing nitrogen assimilation. What are our goals with these amino acids? And we're going to break it down into five categories today. Increasing nitrogen assimilation, we're going to talk about what that means. Increasing chlorophyll production. Increasing carbon assimilation, you know, what does that mean for the plant, right? Amino acid production, so amino acids can turn into other amino acids, and, and what does that mean, and how does this change what we used to do? And finally, increasing anti-stress compounds. So this is the roadmap. This is what we're going to be talking about today. This is the exciting opportunity for you guys sitting out there. How can you get your turf to go through its, its, uh, its processes more efficiently? How can you get it to fix nitrogen and use nitrogen more efficiently? How can you get it to assimilate carbon and build roots and build 
other structures more efficiently, right? How can you get it to go through salty and stressful conditions? And these are hopefully what the answers that we're going to be bringing to the table today. So increase in nitrogen assimilation, okay? What does this mean for the turf, okay? And guys, this is really, really complex. And the only reason I have this stuff down on the slide is so you can see that I'm not making it up, okay? But, but big point here, big picture is whether you apply nitrate, whether you apply ammonium, which is NH4, or whether you apply urea, which eventually turns into ammonium, it all turns into ammonia in the chloroplast, okay? And here's the kicker. Our nitrogen that we feed the plant is useless until we fix it into an organic compound, meaning we add a carbon to it, okay? And these ammonia levels are actually toxic to the cell. So the goal of the plant is when it takes up the nitrogen, it wants to turn it into an organic compound as fast as possible, okay? And what allows it to do that? is glutamate, glutamic acid. That is, that is your bottleneck. If you do not, if your plant was not able to produce glutamic acid or we did not have glutamic acid at sufficient levels in the chloroplast, you would not be able to use the nitrogen that you're giving your plant. And furthermore, it would be toxic. Okay? And the plant has ways where it can, it can cycle the, the, the glutamic acid uh, to the cytoplasm and then back into the chloroplast as it needs it. So there's always these ways, and again, I just want to put this down on paper to demonstrate it, there's always these ways and enzymes the plant's able to, to use and produce to, to allow the plant to get the amino acid where it needs to be, but it has to be there. So what's our takeaways? So ammonia is the end source available to the plants regardless of what input you use, whether it's nitrate, ammonium, whether it's urea, it all turns into ammonia in the chloroplast. Ammonia is toxic, and we have to put a carbon to it as soon as possible, and glutamic acid is necessary for this conversion. That's really neat. So, again, that's science, that's abstract. Let's bring Kurt in now to talk with some of the superintendents about what this has meant for them. Thanks, George. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a really interesting concept, I think. Uh, as, a, as, a golf, as a former golf course superintendent growing turf grass around uh, Columbus, Ohio uh, for, for many years, and, and I think a, a lot of guys who maintain cool season turf have been through this type of, of scenario before. Uh, coming out of spring where, where the temperatures warm up, you get some favorable weather, and, and the turf really starts to grow. and You get great color and, and things are going gangbusters. And then all of a sudden, maybe it's late April, maybe it's uh, first of May, you go through a stretch of really cold, cloudy, uh, rainy weather. And the turf kind of goes in, in, a, in a bit of a tailspin. It starts getting very chlorotic and, and just weak looking. And I, I always attributed that, you know, that chlorotic the yellow appearance to, all right, well, you know, there, it's a lot of cloudy weather here. The plant's not building chlorophyll and keeping up with the growth. But, you know, bringing to light the fact that, that a, um, uh, a, a low supply of glutamic acid could result in, in uh, keeping that plant from converting inorganic nitrogen into a carbon form, and, and uh, even more so, a buildup of that ammonium nitrogen in the plant being toxic to the plant, you could see where with a downturn in weather and a cool, cloudy weather where the plant may not be able to produce glutamic acid like it should, and, and you have this buildup of, of uh, ammonium nitrogen, especially when you have a high intake of nitrogen early on in that season with the, with the previous um, uh, good, good weather. And so uh, I think that's, that, that's, that's interesting, and, and that downturn in turf could be coming from that, that, that ammonium toxicity as, as well. So um, not, that it's, not that it's a cataclysmic event. Um, it's, gonna, it's probably not going to cause a, a, a great loss of turf. But what we're trying to do here is increase uh, growth efficiency and, 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 and uh, physiological efficiency in the plant. And, and any time we can avoid these peaks and valleys of growth, that's, gonna, that's going to impact the plant in terms of uh, having, uh, down, down the road, having better carbohydrate reserves in, in general. So uh, that's my thoughts there. And now I'd like to bring on Brent from, from Mayfield Sand Ridge to talk a little bit about the first time that, that you use uh, our foliar pack slash ENP products. And I believe it was uh, a similar type of situation 
is what I what I described. So uh, Brent, if you can chime in. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. Uh, yeah, we we first started using uh, foliar pack in uh, the spring of 2012. It was one of those years we we actually got off to one of our quickest starts. We typically airify mid-April, but this uh, this year, in particular in 2012, we were able to airify in uh, March, and I mean it was one of the warmest marches in history for Cleveland, Ohio, and airify and everything was great. About a week later, we got four inches of snow. Uh, five weeks later, we still had snow flurries and stuff. And, and basically what we were seeing was, I mean, what Kurt was describing. It was chlorotic. We weren't getting growth. And I, I, it didn't matter what I put down. I, I was not seeing a, a response. So just happened to have an appointment with the uh, Advanced Turf Solutions rep that day and we're looking at things and he's like would you be interested in trying our, our product line and I said well I'm going out tomorrow with a spray if you can have it here by 7 tomorrow I, I'll, I'll use it so he left right then and went and grabbed the product and, and we used it and, uh, and that, that's sort of how we got started it was you know, one of those cold springs and and we have L93 creeping bent grass and we're about 10 miles south of Lake Erie, so we we stay cold, you know, for a while. I mean, it, it's June, we'll still have frost up this way, so it's I, I've seen a big improvement with the, you know, the turf strength and color in the spring since we started using aminos. Brent, do you have any recommendations on on timing or you know? Uh, sort of the practical aspects of when you're going to look to get it down and, and to, to get that result? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think when we're, we're trying to do this, uh, again, the, the weather up here by Lake Erie, um, as you would know, Pat, is uh, pretty unpredictable. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, so uh, we're, we're trying. We, we don't do a whole lot in April. I mean, we, we may feed a little bit of just urea and potassium and calcium, and maybe a, an application here or there. If it, if it looks like we're going to have a, a stretch of four or five days in a row, then maybe we'll go out with a foliar spray with some aminos um, sort of towards the end of uh, April. So soil temperatures get up 55 or so, but, you know, it really it gets into the beginning of May for, for us. I mean, yeah. we're, we're in our own little microclimate even compared to the west side of Cleveland. So, I mean, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, between even Akron, Chardon, um, Westlake, the, there's all micro and climates. But I, I think sort of end of April, beginning of May for us up here. Cool. Thanks. So, um, George, uh, I think your your next step here is uh, to to uh, talk about some other ways that the amino acids are uh, going to impact color, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked about nitrogen stimulation and how we can get these amino acids, and specifically glutamic acid, uh, how we can leverage that to use our, our nitrogen more efficiently. And I think Kurt had some good ideas and, and some good theories about what we're seeing in the spring, especially as the plant is moving a little bit slower how can we make this nitrogen uh, be used more efficiently? But color, I mean, we're, all, we're always looking at color. It's one of the, you know, one of the uh, uh, ways that we judge turf health is uh, look at how green it is. So chlorophyll is a big part of that. So I, I wanted to take everyone through this process of how chlorophyll is built. And again, nobody should memorize this. I don't memorize this. I just put it down on a PowerPoint slide to prove that I'm not making it up. But glutamic acid is actually the starting material for chlorophyll. Um, that is, this is where your carbon comes from in your chlorophyll pigment. As you've noticed here, you need iron and you need magnesium to be able to make chlorophyll. But iron is not actually a part of the chlorophyll pigment itself. Magnesium is, but iron is not. So what happens is you need iron, you need magnesium, but you need glutamic acid and eventually you make chlorophyll. Okay? If you don't have glutamic acid, you can't make chlorophyll. You can dump as much iron as you want, you can dump as much nitrogen as you want, but again, you're not going to be able to make chlorophyll without glutamic acid, which is powerful. So when we're going through our trials in the beginning and we're learning, we're doing these replicated studies, and we're seeing a better green, I mean, it, it jumps out at you, a deeper green, just by using glutamic acid, 
and you say to yourself, why is that? This is why. So why don't you jump back in, Kurt, and, uh, and, and get Keith on the line here to talk about what the amino acids have done you know, for him and his color, and his course. Yeah, right. And, you know, first of all, we're talking about improving plant efficiencies here by, by increasing protein production through nitrogen assimilation. We're not only through, not only are we impacting color here with, with better chlorophyll synthesis, but we're impacting photosynthetic efficiency. So uh, it's interesting, and I want to bring Keith on from, from Quail Hollow to talk about a couple of his, his experiences and uh, um, some advantages that, that uh, Keith, that, that you, you gained from the use of our Grow 40 product, which is our, uh, which is our concentrated amino acid supplement that, uh, that you used uh, prior to the, the Wells Fargo P PGA Tour event this, this, this year. Can you weigh in? Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, uh, we've been very impressed with the, uh, the amino acids in our program and the fact that I feel like that we don't have to put out as much nitrogen to get the color response. Um, goes along with what George said there. And uh, I feel like we have a much healthier plant, uh, better capable of handling stress of tournaments where we turn off the water and we expect to keep the color. Uh, we, we saw that firsthand this past year on our ryegrass. Um, even more so uh, impressed that the Bermuda grass base uh, that we're actually playing golf of during the Wells Fargo Championship. You know, the ryegrass just provides the color, but the uh, uh, the Bermuda grass base underneath uh, actually was in very, very good health, uh, where we saw divots starting to recover through uh, from rhizome and stolen growth, um, and where we were able to stop putting out sand and seed to fill divots uh, before the tournament. And, and all this comes with um, less than ideal soil temperatures, where you would think that you know, the, the Bermuda grass shouldn't start growing, and um, and maybe the ryegrass is just not going to flourish as well uh, without a lot of nitrogen. And we saw both of those things happen uh, with two halves of the amino acid package. Yeah, and, and Keith, uh, I think you mentioned to me prior uh, a couple weeks ago that that you that you really witnessed a, a, a longer color and health residual when, when you package the Grow 40 in with a phosphate and uh, and some other the materials that you're spraying. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, love uh, mixing the, the amino acids with um, with a phosphite. Um, uh, everything I've read about phosphites, you know, has improved um, movement throughout the plant, and you know, just it seems logical to me to mix an amino acid uh, and the Grow 40 in there with it, and just have it get everywhere it needs to get in the plant. Um, and even more so after uh, hearing George speak at, at another class one time that um, you know, the, the amino acids may help uh, things move around in the plant. So anything that, in, in my mind, anything I can mix with an amino acid where I want it to move throughout the plant in different locations, uh, I try to use the Grow, Growplex 40 in that situation. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Keith. Nice uh, observations. Um, and you know, I just want to talk a little bit about how our you know these targeted aminos that we're using they they are increasing plant efficiencies and critical functions in the plant. And, and when we do that, we might be able to to limit some nitrogen inputs. And I'm not talking about dramatically uh, reducing nitrogen applications, but just just Due to some of these material benefits that we get from from our targeted aminos, they could allow us to limit nitrogen and control growth. And uh, Brent, can can you weigh in uh, some of your thoughts on this? Because I know you you've seen some some uh, differences between our, our products and, and programs versus some of the things that you were doing in the past. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, up here in uh, in Cleveland, uh, we're we're blessed with some pretty good weather. I mean, nothing like uh, what Keith deals with down in uh, Charlotte, that's for sure. So we're we're you know average you know about ten days above ninety. And um, but we had three consecutive years, um, 2010, 11, and 12 that were all you know really pretty tough years. 
and going back to 10 and 11, I was using a competitor's product, and you know it was just really difficult to control my, my growth, and I, and I just was cutting nitrogen completely out. Uh, the issue I was having, though, was I, I would see thinning. I mean, just wh wherever the, the cup was that, that day, the turf was just so succulent. So, I mean, we're getting a lot of topical growth, but the plant was not hardened off. It could not take stress. Uh, if we tried to put a roller out there, it, it, it just would want to thin out also. So we were relying more on multiple cuttings. I mean, we were cutting at least twice every day, but, I mean, probably three times a day probably three to four times a week. So, I mean, we're, we're putting a lot of man hours into mowing. Um, going into 2012, um, when we switched to the foliar pack line, we basically took our, our program that we had with a competitor and tried to mimic, you know, the nutrient levels um, per, per week for our applications. Well, instantly, we, we saw a reduced clipping yield. Um, it was just, it was amazing. I mean, we, we went from, like I said, we were probably mowing 16, 17 times a week. We went all the way down to mowing eight times a week. I just threw a double cut in because I, I was used to doing it uh, in the past, so I figured I, I had to double cut one day a week. Our, our um, green speeds, you know, increased. Turf health was, you know, remarkable. Rooting, um, but we're, we're on bent grass, so Obviously, we're going to have a little bit better rooting than a POA, of course, but, I mean, our rooting went from probably three to four inches prior years to um, probably six inches that, that first year. So traffic was much better, just overall consistency, plant health. Um, that, that's what we really noticed that, that first year, and it has continued um, uh, for each of the, the last five seasons, including this year we had... Uh, another pretty difficult season this year and it's uh, still um, just the same. It, uh, it works great with reduced clipping. Hey, hey Brent, this, I think we have a, a question from the audience that's kind of relevant to that. And Kurt, you obviously can jump in here too. How about impact on PGR uptake? Did you see any change in the way your PGR uh, applications were working as they interacted with the amino acids? Yeah, and I know I'm going to touch on this later with uh, with my airification time, but uh, but I think probably now is a good time. Um, we use a um, a plant growth regulator called Trimit, and it's it's a soil absorbed uh, regulator. So we have not noticed a very increased amount of plant growth regulation from I think the deeper rooting all of a sudden I, I think it has more of an opportunity to stay in the plant a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, a, a few years ago when we were um, aerifying, the, the first year I used the, the product, we, we aerified and it healed in instantly. The second year, I think our rooting was even that much better. The mass was, was just so great. I think the trim it stayed in the plant longer and we actually healed in a little bit slower that, that year even though the plant mm -hmm. was healthy, but I think um, we were just too regulated, and now we have to know how to sort of get off the regulation like two weeks prior to it and then get right back onto it. So, it's, uh, um, so yeah, definitely I think it's uh, increased regulation. And, and yeah, Pat, if, I can jump, if I can jump in, we're going to talk about foliar updates and, and what that means for PGRs. Um, later on as well, and then how, how we think that that works from a foliar perspective. Okay, okay. So that, that's coming. Very good. Very good, George. Kurt, is that, are, are we good here? Yeah, I think we're good here. Um, obviously, we've got more to say about that like um, uh, later on because we do see some, some very nice interaction with uh, growth regulators, but uh, we'll, we'll hit upon that later. So, all we're hearing thus far is that, look, we're, we're trying to help the plant go through its processes more efficiently. So we're helping it fix nitrogen more efficiently. We're helping them build chlorophyll more efficiently. And so all of a sudden, the idea of, well, we've got to dump nitrogen into the plant as much as we can, and, and, and we've got to dump as much iron as we can in the plant, you know, it, it's, all, it's all fine and good. But if you don't have uh, these amino acids in there, and we've talked about glutamic acid thus far to, to help you through these processes, you know, that's the bottleneck. And so 
what we're finding out is maybe by, by applying these amino acids in certain concentrations at certain times, we're, we're able to do more with less and, and have better quality turf at the end of the day. So shifting gears, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to go in and talk about carbon assimilation now, okay? So carbon assimilation, this is a, a wonderful piece here. I think people are going to print this out and probably put it up on their wall. But where I'm going with this is that there are two types, two types of turf that we're working with, which is C3 and C4 turf, okay? And C4 is usually your warm season turf, okay? And really we're going to talk about there's differences between C3 C3 and C4. So this is, we're going to start talking about C4, and C4 plants have evolved. They've, they've developed uh, these organelles and uh, structures that involve mesophyll and then the bundle sheath cells. And the whole point of this is that they're trying to concentrate the carbon in the plant to maximize photosynthetic efficiency. Okay, and we're going to talk in the next slide of, of what's happening there when those small pores open and you're bringing in CO2, but you're also bringing in oxygen, right? We've got CO2 in the air, we've got oxygen in the air, but all we really want is the CO2. We need to fix that carbon. And so what happens here is that the sphartic acid is actually your carrier, your carbon carrier, that allows you to take the carbon that the plant's taken up and put it in a bundle sheath cell so it can be used to make photosynthesis. Okay? So I think there's, there's people out there right now, and, and there's competitors of ours, that will say, hey, we've got this carbon product, and it might be humic acid based, it might be whatever based, okay? And they're going to say, hey, this carbon is going to be great for the plant. The plant's going to be able to take it and fix nitrogen and all this and fix, fix the photosynthate and do all this stuff. And that, that's not true. It's got to be in a specific form. And in this case, it's aspartic acid to go into bundle sheath cell to be fixed. So with aspartic acid, we have that opportunity in warm season turf. And then on the back end, to take it back out, you need alanine. Okay? So that's a discussion for another day. Now, for our C3 turf, uh, we have this thing called photorespiration. And the C3 turf did not evolve. It's still kind of stumbling through. They're opening up their smaller pores, and they're taking what they get. And so what happens is the plant also takes up oxygen, okay? Now, that oxygen is not able to be used for photosynthesis, obviously, okay? So up to 25% of your photosynthetic process could be wasted in a C3 plant, okay? So what do we do here, and what are the options? Glycine is actually able to donate a carbon to turn O2 into CO2, basically. And it can go through the peroxisome or it can go through the cytosol and into the chloroplast. But at the end of the day, the take-home message here is that glycine can donate a carbon and take that wasted O2 and turn it into CO2. Okay, so when we're getting out there and we're doing trials with glycine and we're seeing just better overall health, you know, this is one reason why we're seeing this, okay? So this is, again, really deep science, but if we just make it simple on ourselves, you need aspartic acid to be able to fix that carbon in your C4 plant, and you need glycine to be able to help your plants out when it's taking up oxygen. So, Kurt, why don't you talk about what this means? And you know, again, that's very sciencey, very abstract. What does this actually mean, though? What does this What does this do to the turf at the end of the day when we're able to increase our uh, our carbon assimilation efficiency? Yeah, so let, let's talk about bringing together uh, all these processes that you talked about a little bit, George. I mean, increasing uh, photosynthetic activity um, through the use of glutamic acid, increasing nitrogen, nitrogen assimilation, which results in better protein production. And now we're talking about increasing uh, carbon assimilation, which leads directly to building more energy through photosynthesis. So. Um, and it's pretty exciting stuff because because when when we help the plant build more and more energy and more carbohydrates, it can divert some of that energy to building roots. And um, these pictures here help me tell uh, a story that uh, occurred this year. On the left, you see a sod strip, and that sod was was placed down in March um, on a on a green here in, in central Ohio. And uh, it was it was placed there to repair a hydraulic leak. Uh, I came back and visited the superintendent in in late July. It was almost August first. Uh, the picture on the right, where we stuck a probe in the ground there in that sod and pulled out uh, this core, and now you're looking at eight, seven, eight inches of roots. And the superintendent looked at me and he said, "Hey, you know this is this is sod. I would expect this from seed." Uh, a seeded turf, but this is, this is sod. I need to talk to George. I mean, are you telling me that, that your amino acid program is doing this much for the plant 
or it's helping build that in, build energy. So so it's you know pushing roots like this. Like, well, hey, this is uh, this is your green. This is not a picture from a hundred miles away, there, bud. So uh, pretty cool stuff. And um, you know, again, it's 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 uh, uh, this overall process devoted to to improving uh, overall plant energy. So uh, I, I want to shift gears a, a little bit because this is a cool season turf and uh, bring, bring bring Keith back into the discussion. <clears throat> and Keith, if you can uh, talk a little bit about how you've used amino acids uh, to, to improve plant health on warm season turf, especially in the shoulder uh, parts of the, of the year. Yeah, Kurt. So um, uh, here at Quail, we have um, champion greens and We've had many vertigreens. Um, both ultra dwarf uh, Bermuda grasses are very, uh, very dependent on sunshine, um, and clear skies, and sunny days in order to to thrive and, and to just be in their happy spot. So, typically in the spring and fall in the Carolinas, we get stuck in our what I call the shoulder months. We get stuck with some cloudy weather, some adverse conditions, and uh, and a lot of times the ultra dwarf Bermuda grass greens. Uh, uh, they want to thin out a little bit on you or during that time, much like the, the bent grass gets in their stress situation during the summer. We have two stresses uh, being spring and fall. And uh, what I've seen is that, uh, and, and just listen to what George is saying, it makes sense, but uh, previously not knowing the science behind it, what, what we've seen is when we spray amino acid products on, on the greens, um, we tend to get a healthier, more healthier, more upright uh, tight growth habit. Um, we're able to decrease the amount of water that we're putting on the greens, better drought stress, um, especially in the fall. Now, one, one of the things that happens in the fall in the Carolinas is we go from this very hot, humid, kind of tropical uh, moisture environment in August, and sometime around Labor Day, uh, the fall air blows in here and we get cool, dry air. So not only is the plant stressed from not having uh, the heat, uh, and humidity, but when that humidity drops and it gets uh, really dry air, it's like the soil loses all the moisture and it's, it's just a little bit of a shock to the plant. So um, in using the GrowPlex 40, we've, we've seen deeper rooting and where we're not having to water as much in the fall to keep the plant happy. And then again, going back to the, the cloudy intervals, um, it seems like using the amino acid-based products really, really helps with the plant health and the density, and it helps us uh, struggle through those cloudy days. Thanks, Keith. Um, those are observations that we that we hear from uh, from many many folks uh, that uh, use them using the product. So appreciate your your insight there, uh, George. Back to you. Yeah. For, uh, yeah. Absolutely. That was uh, great stuff, Keith. And you know, again. When you when you pair that up with the science behind it, it all kind of begins to make sense. Um, one thing that we had uh, when we switched, you know, philosophies here, and we used to do 18 different amino acids. You know, we had questions about, well, are we sure that you know a couple of different amino acids are, are better than applying all 18? And so, you know, at the end of the day, what we're doing here and, and where the opportunities are is that these amino acids that we're applying, and, and in the case of aspartic acid and glutamic acid. We call them upstream amino acids because what happens is through different amino transferase enzymes, they can turn into other, quote, downstream amino acids. And so instead of applying 18 amino acids and just hoping for the best and saying, hey, you know, we know you need histidine and lysine and methionine and all the other great amino acids out there, now we're letting the turf decide, okay? So the turf can take glutamic acid and it can turn it into three different amino acids in one step. And from those, it can turn into glutamine, can turn into histidine, and ornithine turns into eventually arginine. So that's great. You know, histidine is important for zinc and nickel accumulation in plants. That's wonderful. Okay, but instead of just applying histidine, we're applying a high amount of glutamic acid, and we're letting the plant decide. The plant's going to send signals within itself to say, "Hey, you know what? I need to I need I need to work on my zinc and nickel accumulation. I, I, I'm going to transfer some of this glutamine and, and turn it into histidine, right?" Or arginine, right? It's important nitrogen storage and transport. If, if the plant and turf needs to store nitrogen, it'll turn it into ar you know, arginine. Great. Proline. We're going to talk about proline a lot here in a little bit. We talk about anti-stress, but it's an osmolite in the vacuole. 
you know, meaning that it's loaded in the vacuoles and it uh, it helps the uh, the water stay in the vacuoles and the vacuole will maintain its shape. Which again, turf's composed of eighty percent water. That's really important stuff. But again, we're we're allowing a plant to kind of decide this uh, and what it's doing. Same for aspartic acid. In one step, it can turn into asparagine, methionine, lysine, and, and threonine, and then some of these amino acids can turn into others. So again, it indicates nitrogen status in the plant with glutamine. There's a balance there. Great. Okay, but we're not going to apply it, uh, and we're going to let the turf decide it needs it. Methionine, building up signal uh, transduction in plants that helps the plant communicate with each other. It's kind of an interstate within the plant. Methionine plays a role in that. Lysine can turn into glutamic acid. It also can turn into dehydrin proteins, which help the plant go through these, these uh, stressful times, especially when you talk about water concerns. And threonine, it helps regulate the, the levels of pyruvate. You know, it's involved in the energy production in the plant all great things. In the past, we would have just sprayed all these amino acids out in various concentrations, and, and it was a great story. But but now we've got the science to back it up, and so we're sitting there, and you're, you're probably asking yourself, and if you haven't done it yet, you might later. How do we know, George? How do we know that glutamic acid and aspartic acid turns into these different, these different amino acids, or turns into chlorophyll, or turns into uh, any of the structures that we've talked about? And this is research we're going to continue to do in 2017 that we've already done, we're taking isotopes of amino acids, okay? So we're adding an extra proton to your nitrogen or an extra proton to your carbon. The carbon has 12 protons and nitrogen has 14 protons. And what this allows us to do is to be able to track this. And we, when we spray these isotopes of amino acids on the on the uh, foliage of the turf in the greenhouse and then we harvest that turf, we're able to take it to the metabolomics facility and we're able to actually track where did that carbon-13 or nitrogen-15 amino acid turn into. Did it turn into glutamic acid? You know, did it turn into the chlorophyll? Did it, did, it, did it go into proline? Did it do other sorts of things? And we can track it down to that level. That, that's exciting. You know, for us, we're able to check the uptake rate for these different amino acids and optimal growing conditions. But we're also able to see the metabolic state when, when there's different environmental conditions. So when the conditions are optimal, the plant says, hey, you know what? I, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm just going to make more chlorophyll, or I'm going to bank this into proline, or I'm going to turn this into lysine, right? In drought stress, the plant may say, you know what, I, I'm going to take this glutamic acid, I'm going to turn it into as much proline as I can, and, and as much gamma immune butyric acid as I can, I'm going to load it up. So there's different, different signals that, that, that happens, and the plant can use this amino acid gift, which is basically what it is, uh, in different ways. So I just want to make you guys aware of it, say, hey, we're, we're doing this, we've done it, we've got early data in our hands now, and we're going to continue this in a big way. And this is, this is a unique way to look at it. I think in the past, when you look at what other people have done, they go to a university and they go to the turf guy and they say, hey, Dr. So-and-so, why don't you spray this out in replicated trials and let's, let's see if it changes color. Let's see how it survives the summer. Let's see all this stuff. And don't get me wrong, we're doing that. But to me, you know, the question is why? Why is this happening? And to, to do that, you've got to break it down in, in, into metabolic physiology. And uh, that's the exciting research that we're doing and we're going to continue to do. So to finish this up, the last category here is stress reduction. And this is, we've talked about you know, indirect benefits, nitrogen assimilation, carbon assimilation, building more chlorophyll, right? Uh, uh, having the opportunity to change into different amino acids. But what about direct benefits? Are we directly uh, uh, effectuating this, this positive change in turf and allowing it to go through these stressful conditions. And I'll, I'll tell you where we started. We started in a greenhouse and we were doing replicated trials with different amino acids. And we would spray a couple sprays of amino acids and then we started uh, irrigating with salt water. Literally the same salt concentration as the ocean. And the survival rate of these different plots it was dramatic. Uh, how much better the turf survives when you when you fed it, say, glutamic acid versus you know, uh, a package of 18 different amino acids at the same total concentration. So, you know, as glutamic acid, let's use that as an example, they can turn into something called gamma amino butyric acid, which is a mouthful, but it's an osmolite. Up to 50% of it can be found in the vacuole. It can be transferred from cell to cell, depending on where it needs to go. And what does this mean? It's helping the vacuole heat that water, okay? Everything that we're really concerned about when you talk about stress is maintaining the water in the cell. And to understand that, you have to understand osmosis, which at the end of the day, osmosis is water wants to flow from a concentration of low salt to a concentration of high salt. We're going to cover this in the next couple slides, but basically, if your salt concentration becomes higher, if you have drought conditions, if you're fertilizing, or you just have a lot of salt left in your soil, for instance, any type of salt, calcium, sodium, 
whatever you have, water will want to leave the cell of your plant and go into the go into the water, go into the water table there in the soil. And we have to prevent that from happening, and that's where we have these osmolites, okay? So, so GABA is one of those osmolites, okay? Glycine is another one. It turns into choline. Choline is another osmolite. It's loaded up in the vacuoles as well as the chloroplast, okay? Choline is also converted to glycine B chain. And this is, again, a lot of science, but at the end of the day, your takeaway message here is that glycine will also load up into the vacuoles and metabolite. It will also load up in the chloroplast, which will, at the end of the day, prolong the life of your chloroplast, okay? Especially in, in your high salt, low temperature environment, maintaining function of chloroplast is really important, okay? Plants, plants cycle through chloroplast continuously anyway. So if we can take the life cycle, and this is all theoretical, let's just say we take the life cycle of a chloroplast from one day and, and turn it into a one day and a half, right? And, and so now what you have is the plant, instead of having to replace that chloroplast frequently, it can divert its energy doing other things. Okay, proline, we talked about that. How does proline work, okay? Proline is actually the only cyclic amino acid, meaning that's a circle, all right? And think of it in this analogy. If you have a sack and you fill it up with brick, and then you fill it up with water, and if you pour that water out, your sack begins to shrink. It can only shrink as much as those bricks, the physical structure of those bricks allow it to do, and that's how proline works. As the vacuole starts to come under pressure because your salt levels are building outside of your soil and your, and your water starts to leave, the proline that's in there will maintain that shape and act as that brick inside your vacuole and allow it to only shrink to a certain point. So at the end of the day, we saw this picture earlier, this blue thing is our vacuole there, okay? You know, we're talking about how do we keep that water in that vacuole, right? With osmolite, okay? And, and you guys are already have been using an osmolite since probably the day you started working on a golf course and the first foremost, potassium, right? That's a, that's a huge osmolite. Potassium is the only nutrient, okay, that, uh, that does not actually become an organic uh, form in the plant. It stays K plus and it's loaded up in the vacuole, okay? Uh, another osmolite is GABA. We talked about that from, from uh, glutamic acid. Glycine betaine, proline. There's also proline betaine. So proline can metabolize into proline betaine. Choline, okay, that comes from glycine and glutamic acid itself. So when we're using these amino acids, we're loading the plant up with these osmolites, we're increasing the good salt, right? Because water is going to evaporate, right? And, and our salt concentration is going to increase outside of the cell. And so at the end of the day, we're just fighting against where can whose salt concentra concentration can be higher, inside the vacuole or outside. And so for you guys that are kind of struggling with this concept, you know, one easy way I've been able to kind of describe this is that you're looking at an arms race. This is, think of Cold War. We've got to build our good salts inside our vacuole to keep that water and that concentration there higher than our outside salt concentration, right? And when you do that, and you do that with amino acids, you can, you, you can even take the extreme where you're irrigating with salt water and your turf is still able to function and survive because that water is staying in that vacuole. Your, your cells are not shrinking and not dying. So at the end of the day, you can think of it like this. This is like the Russians from Rocky IV, and this is like Sylvester Stallone. It's, it's oversimplified, but people seem to grasp that concept. Which, which, one's clever, which one's Clever Lang? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's, uh, that's in the next presentation when we talk about amino acids. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But, we'll come back know, to the Clever. <laughs> tune, in, tune in next week for your next, uh, you know, uh, uh, Rocky analogy, okay? <laughs> well so, done. You say hey, people we, laughing, but everyone's muted, so I'm assuming people are laughing here. So <laughs> we, we, we hope so. Hey, we do have a couple of good questions here. If this is a, yeah. a good time to pop those in, we a couple of people have asked, and I, I throw this out to both Keith and Brent. How do how does the foliar pack program? How does the EMP fit now in your program overall? Have you eliminated granulars? Have you uh, reduced them? So maybe, Brent, maybe you could, could start, because I think we have a lot of cool season guys on here. How, how has it affected your overall fertility program? Yeah, sure. Um, good question. Uh, yeah, going back to when we first started, uh, as we were having all that succulent growth prior, uh, we, we basically eliminated all other nitrogen um, granular sources. Um, so we basically just went with the foliar packs line for uh, 
for our, our nitrogen sources as well as uh, all, all other micronutrients. We still did feed calcium, potassium through, through granular application. Uh, about the last couple years, we, we have gone back in with a uh, with a granular. Uh, we're, we're using an organic-based uh, product. Uh, we, we do that at uh, aerification time in spring and fall. We'll, we'll uh -huh. get about a pound of nitrogen out there um, uh, supplemented with the uh, about, about another pound of nitrogen with the uh, full full air feeding. So we're about two pounds of nitrogen and um, uh, you. Basically, we're, we're looking for how, how is the turf handling the stress is, is where we feel that we will need to add a little bit of nitrogen. And okay. uh, just, we started to see a little bit of our, our calcium numbers started to go down, and we, we thought maybe the uh, microbes were, were starting to feed a little bit more, um, and so we, we felt that we needed to put a carbon source back out there. Okay. How about you, Keith? Um, different grass, different requirements. Uh, obviously, we um, we do lean on granulars uh, for our our base nutrients, um, and we do use the uh, the Growplex uh, 40 quite a bit uh, to manage stress. So um, uh, we have a, more of a traditional fertility uh, regimen, but uh, we do supplement uh, quite frequently with the amino acids. Cool. Yeah. There, there was Pat, one, can, oh, yeah, go ahead. Pat, yeah, I'd just like to weigh in on a couple of things real quick. And, um, you know, obviously Keith has, has a different situation than, than our cool season guys for sure and tend to use more nitrogen down in the, in the southern regions with the warm season turf. Uh, but generally speaking, especially on cool season turf, I'd say that, that we, we don't see very many folks that, that rely totally on liquid and full air nitrogen sources and it's usually not something that 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 we recommend uh, honestly and um, but as, as mentioned before there's there's a lot of great impacts here that that uh, allow us to dial in nitrogen and, and reduce it to to a certain extent the other thing I want to uh, mention here is is um, the you know, Brent's using the full air pack line of products uh, we have our ENP turf line of products, and they're very similar. There's some subtle differences between between the uh, the, the two the two brands, but uh, by and large, we're talking about the same technology used, same amino acid uh, technology, and, and and those things. So, okay. Um, we had a good question from our friend uh, Kevin Smith, who's who's over in Tokyo these days, and. Uh, uh, but what, started what in the been up at this hour. Well, yeah, I know it's a little late for him, but you know he's 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 one of those guys who can't stop learning. But but he asks, and, and I'll just read it out. So I recently moved to a part of the world that receives 800 fewer hours of PAR sunlight annually compared to Atlanta, Georgia. Further, we received measurable rainfall of 40 of the first 120 days I was here. Pretty wet. Obviously, disease potential is high. I'm growing both C3 and C4 grasses at putting green height. He has double greens, as do some courses in Japan. Uh, I'm curious about what potential disease suppression benefits I might expect, especially as a tank mix partner with phosphites. So bottom line is, if, if he's mixing uh, your product base with phosphites, what kind of suppression effect might you see? Kurt, do you want to weigh in, or do you want me to, to answer that? Well, yeah, um, and, and Keith actually, Keith uh, hinted on this uh, a little earlier uh, as, he, as he uses uh, tank mixes uh, his, his, uh, uh, with, with his phosphite program, and a lot of folks do. And, and in my opinion, uh, what we do see some uh, some some beneficial uh, effects here and some some additive uh, effects and could be from just further translocation of the product could be from from increasing the the uptake opening the plant up which George is going to talk about here here in a few minutes uh, just uh, similar types of benefits that we that we would see from better um, efficacy of uh, growth regulators uh, you know whether it be 
whether it be uh, you know, sometimes paclobutrazole or whether it be uh, uh, Primo and Trinexapac ethyl. So uh, that, that's, uh, those are my thoughts. Yeah, absolutely, and I'd I'd be lying to you, Pat, if I didn't tell you that uh, we're 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 knee deep in this research right now, especially with phosphites and amino acids. It's uh, it's something that the world, uh, and certainly not just the U.S., but uh, I've read some research trials out of Brazil, uh, over there in Europe, uh, and and the pairing with amino acids uh, and phosphites. And uh, you know, all I gotta say is, is stay tuned. Uh, you know, we've got some really interesting stuff that we're working on in, in, in that category. Okay. Hey, hey guys, cool. let me uh, say one thing, um, just, just to let Kevin know that uh, we spray today our typical uh, fall preventative application for leaf spot and foliar pythium on Bermuda grass and uh, mix the Growplex 40 in there with it. And I tell you, I, I couldn't feel more confident on what I'm going to see over the next two, three weeks on how it's going to work. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, a couple uh, Jordan, I'll turn the floor back over to you here. Yeah, but I, and when we wrap up, I do have a couple more questions from the audience, but I want to make sure you get a chance to, to, to wrap things up here. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple more slides with pictures. Kurt, can you, can you quickly take us through certainly what's going on here in this picture uh, as it relates to stress and low sunlight and temperature changing, and then uh, you know we'll walk through some of the pictures with the superintendent as well. Yeah, and I guess I'd start off by making the point that you know if we were if we were dealing with ideal growing conditions, uh, ninety percent of the time, one hundred percent of the time, the amino acids would would be less um, uh, important to, to use. But we're, we're constantly dealing with different varying stresses, and this is a situation. It's a good example. Um, what we have here is a picture of uh, a, a practice green in North Florida, and this is a tip eagle green. It's overseeded with with poa triv, and you see the orange mark at the bottom of, of the picture that delineates uh, two different treatments. And on the left hand side is the uh, uh, liquid fertilizer program that the superintendent normally uses with with competitive products, and then we coax the superintendent to uh, use, use our, our program with our targeted um, amino uh, products on the right side there. And our program has uh, had just a skosh more nitrogen in it, but not, um, not enough to, to increase growth, to, to change color differences. I mean, for the first eight, nine weeks of this trial, the growth, the color, uh, the, the quality of the turf between the two treatments was exactly equal. I mean, there was no no differences at all. But the interesting thing uh, occurred with, with the weather change in, in late March, uh, late to mid-March, um, the, the, the weather uh, turned pretty nasty, cold, cloudy, very rainy for eight or ten days. And when, when the turf went through that, that period for a while, the, the uh, turf on the left in the picture shows that uh, took a downturn as far as color and quality. You can see you can see the brown color there on the turf on the left. And on the right, with our program, the the turf viability, the color really hung in there through this nasty period. And and these are these are the results that that, that frankly we're excited to see and we're looking for and and, and we want to uh, and and we want to expose all of our customers to. So it's very very, very exciting when we see this type of response. And, and a big part of that is, is uh, the process that George is talking about in terms of, of uploading these osmolites and antioxidants prior to the onset of, of stress. Okay. Um, can uh, begin to wrap this baby up. I want to bring Brent on for, uh, for one more time to talk about uh, how amino acids can deliver a, a more rapid response in terms of stress and recovery. So, real quick, Brent, if you can, you can talk about, especially the first time that you used our aeration recovery program and, and, and the results you got out of that. Again, a low nitrogen program. Yep. 
Sure. Yeah, so the fir first year we used the product, uh, we, we did reduce all nitrogen other sources out that, that first year. And uh, going into aerification, I was a little bit nervous. We aerify in August and uh, still doing quite a bit of play then. And uh, so they had me do a sort of a primer spray with the aminos on a Friday. We began aerification Sunday afternoon. And you could really tell that Sunday morning, whenever we, we mowed, uh, we were getting quite a bit of um, growth. And we we were pretty regulated going into that. We aerified a half the holes on Sunday night, finished up Monday early enough that we actually went back out with our second application of the aminos. And it was literally on Friday, the uh, ATS rep checked in with me just to see how everything was going. and I and sarcastically said it. I was like, uh, I, I wasn't happy with it because we're already healed in and I basically had to aerify again. So I mean, the, the picture on the right, uh, that probably was 10 days later, but uh, it, it probably looked like that about uh, five or six days later. And uh, so it's just amazing how, how it uh, um, healed in that, that quick with very little nitrogen. Right, right. Yeah, these aren't pictures of, of your, your turf. These are uh, actually pictures from a different instance, but just kind of an example to throw up there while, while you spoke. So, um, I, yeah, so really doing a lot of things for the turf um, from, a, from a stress standpoint during that, that uh, recovery period. And, uh, again, helping with protein development, that nitrogen assimilation, um, uh, you know, converting uh, into proteins is really, really important in that process. So, uh, the, and so the last thing that I want to mention here, and we've touched on it already a little bit. Um, I'll let uh, I'll let Keith weigh in it one more time. Is yeah, we do see some really nice benefits when we tank mix certain chemistries with amino acid with our amino acid products. Um, a lot of that we see out of out of growth regulators. And we see some 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 better uh, performance out of out of systemic fungicides as well. And so, Keith, if you can if you can just uh, talk briefly about your experiences this, this uh, spring, especially with your ryegrass and, and how it performed um, with the, the applications of Grow40 and uh, Trinex back up, please. Sure. Um what our problem is is that uh, with, with overseed of Bermuda grass, the, the rate for uh, the growth regulator is pretty much 2x what on rye grass that you would put on Bermuda grass. And so our tournament being in early May, some years the Bermuda is jumping out, um, some years it's not. This past year, like I said earlier, the Bermuda grass is starting to wake up. So we really didn't want to uh, go out and spray a real heavy rate of growth regulator because it would knock the Bermuda back, but we had to figure out something to do to get the ryegrass to shut down um, for tournament quality. And so uh, what we found is when we when we sprayed the uh, Growplex 40 at uh, 55 ounces to the acre or an ounce and a quarter per thousand, uh, we were able to cut our growth regulator rates in half. So instead of uh, instead of spraying 22 ounces to the acre, uh, uh, the Primo, we were able to cut that down to 12 ounces to the acre, and we saw tremendous results. Um, and I think as it moved through the plant so well, um, it, it shut things down, and it did not stop the Bermuda from uh, waking up, and, and we had a successful transition while also uh, regulating the ryegrass to have improved tournament conditions. Thanks, Keith. Um, again, those are observations that we that we uh, hear quite quite often from customers. George, can can you explain a little bit how, uh, how why we might be seeing this this, this occurrence with uh, the tank mix between yeah. Uh, me and yeah, and and this is kind of you know I guess people might be sitting in the stands saying this is kind of an odd odd place to put this in, but really if you look at it, it's about getting these to model pores open up. And the way you do that is you fill the vacuoles in the guard cell. The guard cells, when the vacuoles are full, they'll flex open, which provides you the opportunity and entry point for not only CO2, but also for foliar nutrients, also for PGRs, for systemic pesticides, right? And when your vacuoles aren't open, uh, then your stomatal pores 
uh, begin to close. Your guard cells shrink and uh, and they close up. So for us, the benefit that we're seeing is we're getting these amino acids in there, and, and you know I think we always kind of put things in human being time, like it, it takes us X amount of time to walk a mile or to eat lunch or whatever. But metabolically, things happen very quickly in a cell, and so when we're putting this, we're mixing these amino acids in with this PGR with the systemic pesticide or with your nutrients, what's happening is these amino acids are entering the plant at low molecular weight, entering the plant, going through the vascular system, and then they're, they're metabolizing into these, these osmolites, and, and you're seeing your stromal pores open in real time while that solution is sitting on the leaf. And, uh, you know, Keith's Keith, uh, real-world example of possibilities. Um, you know, in the future, certainly, we can talk about what amino acids are doing as we pair them with nutrients. Uh, what, am I, what amino acids are doing is we pair them with a phosphate ion. I mean, there's there's a lot more to discuss on this topic, but uh, it all flows down to can we fill these vacuoles, and then can we help it move through the vascular system? And, and certainly, what is uh, vascular mobile and what is not is a discussion for another day. But hopefully, we can have that in another webinar in the future. So, uh, takeaways today, and then we can answer hopefully answer a few questions, and uh, we'll look at a distributor map. If you guys are, are excited about talking to somebody more about this. Um, but really, we talked about five things, guys. We talked about nitrogen assimilation, chlorophyll production, carbon assimilation, production of other amino acids, and then increasing your stress resistance. And guys, at the end of the day, what we're talking about is maintaining your turf uh, in stressful conditions, which is very often in what we're doing because of uh, various reasons we looked at the beginning of the presentation. But we're also talking about maximizing the genetic potential of, uh, of your turf. And, uh, and these amino acids, and, and, and specifically certain amino acids at certain concentrations, can be a very powerful tool uh, for anybody's program. Uh, you know, whether you're going to run a complete amino acid program or whether you're just going to throw amino acids in the tank when you're putting out PGRs or systemic uh, uh, pesticides, you will see benefits from, from doing that. And, uh, and our job is to be able to continue to bring the science behind why. Uh, you won't hear from us nebulous statements about amino acids do uh, uh, neat things to the plant, and we're, we're building, uh, 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 you know, some sort of generic protein structures in there. And, you know, we're going to come with you to science to tell you exactly what's going on and, and, and how it's going on, and that, that's what makes a great partnership. So if you guys, and, and we can switch into questions now, I'm going to throw this distributor map up there. We talked about having two brands. There are subtle differences between the two, and uh, there's, there's distributors that carry certain ones depending on in the country. Again, if you're interested in what you've heard today and you want to take action, uh, this is contact information for our distributors. Alternatively, uh, this presentation will be made available to you. At the beginning of the presentation, uh, you had uh, uh, Kurt Guerin's information there as well as my information, uh, and you guys can feel free to reach out to, to either one of us to talk about this more. But uh, Pat, uh, questions from the group, uh, other comments? Yeah, we, we had a couple more good ones just real quickly. Uh, Keith and, and, and uh, I kind of lose my mind. And for the superintendents, are you looking at using any combination of these products going into fall dormancy? Brent, Keith? Um, yes, we do. We, we've continued to use them uh, here. Uh, you know, temperatures are still up for us here, so we, we continue to use them. Uh, we'll probably use them through October, and then we sort of get off of them. Yes, same here. Probably a little bit uh, deeper into the season. Uh, we're not overseeding this year, so um, okay. it's going to be straight Bermuda grass. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to growing grass as long as Mother Nature will let us. And we'll we'll use the amino acids. We'll obviously use some iron and some micronutrients and some magnesium. And as long as we can, uh, the plant can produce chlorophyll and make carbohydrates and, and put them in reserves. Uh, We'll be glad to give it what it needs so that way it wakes up healthy next spring. Okay. And then one quick question probably uh, for uh, George. Have you seen uh, any reduction in summer-induced chlorosis on bluegrass? So we mostly talked about Benton Bermuda. How about bluegrass? Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, we do quite a bit of work with uh, uh, amino acids in the landscape sector as well. And uh, uh, we've seen some, some pretty dramatic color changes in, in really stressed out bluegrass uh, also. Kurt, do you have anything you want to add to that specifically about what you've seen in your backyard? And, and I mean, you know, figurative backyard, not literal. 
<laughs> yeah, you don't want to see my backyard. Um, but yeah, yeah, we do see some some impacts from uh, w with with really any cool season turf. Uh, the aminos are, are uh, building a lot of stress tolerance. They're they're increasing uh, photosynthetic activity, and um, yeah, we we see some very nice impacts. There's we have we have uh, folks that uh, they use them on lawn situations, blue, rye, and um, you know George. We've we've been through a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, recovery situations and high stress situations with with the lawn programs and and see some great results. A absolutely, I mean we had that uh, you know we had a lot of these you know assets go down up there. In, uh, in north central Ohio, where you had that, that terrible drought this year, and uh, you know the color response was was amazing. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, that's, that's a short answer. Terrific. And that covers another, most of. Go ahead. Yeah, um, a lot of folks in terms of using products in the fall are, are combining uh, the amino acids, our Grow 40, say with with the potassium. Program again, you're you're increasing osmolites from a an organic perspective, you know, with your potassium, and an organic perspective with the with the amino acid package, and uh, so that's my two cents there. Okay. All right. Well, I, I want to thank all of you for doing a great job today, uh, and, and our audience for asking some really good questions. I, I I grabbed a few more questions that I'll forward to the folks at EMP that they can answer directly for you. And like we said earlier, we will be sharing all of the information, including a copy of the entire uh, webinar for your perusal, but also if you want to share it with other people, uh, you'll, you should receive that within about a week or so. But again, um, any last thoughts, George? Uh, you did a great job, and, and we almost stayed on time, but any, any last thoughts to share today for our attendees? Yeah, I, I want to thank you, Pat, for the opportunity. You and your team have done a great job. I want to thank everyone for being on the uh, presentation today. We've got a lot more interesting stuff to talk about from here, and uh, you know, hopefully, we'll have an opportunity to do this again in the uh, in the near future. That sounds great. Well, well, thanks to thanks to all of you and Keith, Brent. We'll uh, we'll hopefully see both of you soon. Brent, I may see you tomorrow. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, Keith, I, I might be forced to come down and visit you next uh, next August and see what's going on down there. So, so with that, uh, thank you very much to all of you for attending. And as always, uh, we look forward to hearing any feedback you have about our webinars. Have a great day, and we'll talk again soon. Take care.